super excited to have him here. And uh, make sure you thank him for driving all the way up here from Joplin um, after he preaches for us. And, and thank him for that. And um, I'll let him talk to you guys a little bit more about uh, not only his, his journey to vocational ministry, but then also John chapter 8. So, My hello. Yeah, there we go. All right. So, yeah, um, I was talking to Nathaniel a little bit before I was, um, or as I was driving up here, and he asked me to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me. So, uh, hi, I'm Nathan Schultz, and um, I am a former Missouri S&T student, a former aerospace uh, program student, and um, here I've been feeling like I've been called to ministry my whole life. And I was just never super confident in it. And um, there, there came this opportunity, uh, Canacook. And um, while I went there, I got to experience this, um, this transformation where I was, never, I was never confident in my speaking ability. And I, ne- I was never um, confident in the fact that, like, this is God's word. It's so powerful. And I didn't understand how God was going to use me until I actually went there. I took the leap of faith, and I was thinking, okay, if I'm going to be in engineering, this is going to be my thing. I'm just going to be there for the students. I'm going to be in a church, and um, engineering is going to be my job, but this is going to be the side thing. And when I went there, it completely transformed my uh, perception on ministry altogether. And um, at the end of the 10 weeks, Joe was there, um, I just made the decision that, you know, I really want to, I want this to be my life. And um, I switched the, like, very last week that I was there at Canacuck, and um, I'm going on my second year at Ozark Christian College now, and uh, it's been an awesome change, and um, it's a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun, and I really feel like this is where God's been calling me, so I would really encourage you, if you are hearing that call, don't ignore it. This is something that has really changed my life. And whether, whether or not this is going to be your call and your only thing that you do, engineering or ministry, I encourage you to be involved in ministry, be involved with the church, because it's crazy to see what God does in your life if you just open up and let him speak. So... Um, that kind of leads up to now, and um, I'm going to go ahead and start. So, yeah, a little while back, my friend Aaron Moyer just stands up, kind of out of the blue, and he says, you know what, Nathan, you are super gullible and easy to pick on. It's like I don't even have to try. I'm like, uh, how dare you? Me? I'm not gullible. I mean, as one of my good friends once said, oh, I'm a goofy goober, yeah, but I ain't gullible. And almost immediately, my other friend, Colt Doherty, like, speaks up and he says, you know, Nathan, did you know that gullible isn't in the dictionary? I'm going to let that marinate for those of you that might be like me. <laughs> did anyone fall for that? Don't raise your hands, it's okay. Me and my stupid self are sincerely replied, wait, really? <laughs> And almost immediately as those words came out of my mouth, I realized just the gravity of what I'd just done. But it's okay. It's okay. I'm forgiven. It's okay. And it was even funnier whenever I was walking through this sermon with my girlfriend, and uh, she fell for it too. So uh, it's just perfect. Anyways, I completely turned the situation back around on them and said, here's the deal. I have absolutely no reason not to trust you. Don't give me a reason. And almost immediately, you could see like, the fear in their eyes. They, were, they just felt like horrible people for messing with this the innocent and, I guess, gullible little lamb that I am. <laughs> and, you know, I had been planning that line for years. They didn't really know that, but I had been planning that line for years. And when they finally said that, and I finally replied, I was like, yeah, that's what you get for messing with me, you little turd nuggets. Gosh. <laughs> but, you know, it also... Other than that, nothing's really changed ever since I was just this little tyke. I was super gullible back then, too. And I was this kid that had it in his head that he could do anything and everything he put his mind to. Basically, or mainly because my parents believed in me. And I'm sure your parents have encouraged you with some similar words. Um, But mine meant in a loving way, as soon as 
But as soon as I heard those words, it's like this little switch flipped in my brain. And it's like it said, Nathan, you're just, you're not good enough. And I proceeded to get myself stuck in this cycle of self-fixation, this, this pride that I just, I always wanted to be a better version of myself, but never ended up being satisfied with who I was. And, you know, it came to this point where my response just became natural. I, was, I just said, okay, okay, I'll be better. But very, I didn't know how much I was fighting myself. I didn't know how much I was fighting God and his plans for me. And how is little Nathan supposed to find freedom from a self-fixation, this pride that he trapped himself in? It just took me down a path of depression that I, I just couldn't get out. And I'm hoping that John chapter 8 will answer that question. So if you would, please join me in prayer. Uh, King Jesus, you are such a good and amazing God. I thank you for this opportunity to speak here in front of my friends, and I pray that your words penetrate our hearts and minds as we read through it. I pray, uh, please guide my tongue as I attempt to unpack it, and when we all leave, I pray that we have a greater understanding of who you are as our God. So thank you again, it's in your name that I pray, amen. Uh, If you have your Bibles, please open them to John chapter 8, verses 31 through 59. And while you guys are turning there, if you're not already there, um, I would really encourage you to be listening and looking for any, anything related to freedom and slavery, because we're going to try to answer the question of how can Nathan become free. So let's start with verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, but we're we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I know that you're Abraham's descendants, yet you're looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your Father. Now, let's stop right there. Here, there are two different levels of freedom from sin that Jesus is talking about, two different levels of freedom. The first level is freedom from earthly or worldly or the practice of the ungodly nature, okay? And if you look back at verse 34 again, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And I was reading this commentary as I was studying this. It was a Tyndale commentary, and I was, uh, as I was reading, I found out that they defined the word slave in verse 34 here as this. It's a service to one master as devotion out of love. Let me restate that. Everyone who sins serves sin as devotion out of love for sin. Just think about that. Now let me ask the questions. Why do you think Jesus wants us to live in obedience to him? Why does he think that submission to him is actually freedom? Well, if we look back at verses 31 and 32, now that you obey me, you know the truth, and the truth sets you free. In other words, obedience leads to wisdom, and wisdom leads to a choice. You can either choose to love and love sin and be dead, or you can obey Jesus and be free. The back half of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He knows That your love for the world is dragging you down, and he so badly wants you to be free of that. At the same time, it's it's your choice. Here's the truth. Our submission means freedom from sin's opposition. The second level of freedom is um, freedom from the result of sin, which is death. 
What Jesus is saying in verse 35 and 36 is that those who are slaves to sin, they acting out the practice of the ungodly nature, have no place in the family. Because we have sinned, we have fallen short of the glory of God and do not belong in his presence. We don't deserve to be in his presence. But I thank God that there's grace. You and I are sinners, but if you've been adopted into the family of Christ, then you belong to it forever because Christ sets you free. That makes what, I'm sorry, uh, free from the death that we deserve because Jesus took care of it. That is what makes the death that Jesus died so bittersweet because we're supposed to be the ones on the cross, not him. Here's the truth. Christ's obedience is stronger than death's greediness. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Verse 39. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do as Abraham did. As it is, you're looking for a way to kill me, a man who, told, who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You were doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. God said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I've come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there was no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. And let's stop here again. The Pharisees just weren't having it from Jesus. They just weren't. <laughs> Don't you understand, Jesus? That we're, the, we're already the experts on the law and God's word. Who are you to tell us what he wants? And just like me, they were so self-centered that they couldn't see past their pride. Just to clarify, yes, both the Pharisees and I, this little messed up little me, we're both caught up in our pride. And I've heard it said like this, you can either be so caught up in your successes or your failures. Both are problems of pride. And John 20, or 12, 43 admits, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. In either case, pride completely opposes God. It completely mocks him as if the Pharisees were saying, God, you're not, you're not worthy enough to take control of my life. Or as if I, I'm saying, God, you're not good enough to fix the problems in my life. Either case is just spitting in God's face. And on, on the other hand, Jesus only thought about us. There was absolutely nothing keeping him from stepping off a throne other than you and I. Nothing. He completely wiped himself clean by taking on flesh, becoming vulnerable and blank. And he, he grew in wisdom and in stature. Meaning he didn't, he wasn't born with all the knowledge of God. Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He completely stripped himself clean. He had to relearn everything for your sake. And that led him to the cross. Guys, I can't even comprehend the humility of our Savior. Here's the truth. Christ's humility frees us from slavery. C.S. Lewis said, humility isn't thinking less of ourselves, it's thinking of ourselves less. And I would encourage you to ask God what he wants from you instead of asking him to bless the things that we want to do. Just like my story, I, I finally ended up submitting to him and it was the best thing that I had ever done. Our freedom is in obedience. And our freedom is in humility. Let's look at verse 48. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and um, demon-possessed? 
And this is, this is the part where Jesus says under his breath, Oh my me. <laughs> and, and then he says, I am not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, now we know that you're a demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death? Are you greater than our father father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it and was glad. (laughs) You're not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you've seen Abraham? Yeah, right. Very truly I tell you, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. And this is the part of the Bible where I wish it would give me just a little bit more. It's, I'm I'm just still in awe at how Jesus just walked out. Like, how do you just, I'm going to go pick up, oh, he's gone. (laughs) It's like Batman's little vanishing trick when he's talking on a rooftop with Commissioner Gordon. He's talking, you know. And then he turns around to make the scene all dramatic. And he's not necessarily looking right at the camera, just a little bit off. And he turns back around and... He's gone. Everyone's amazed, yada, yada, yada. But if I'm being honest, I really can't wait until that day that I get up into heaven and I can see this scene played out on the big screen in heaven. Oh, it's going to be so awesome. Hey, Hey, yo, JC! Go get the popcorn and show me how you did the thing. He's going to be like, oh, he did the thing? I'm like, oh, yeah, dude, the thing. You know what I'm talking about. He's like, oh. <laughs> anyway, on a, on a serious note, the Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying. When Jesus said, I am, in verse 58, he quoted a famous Old Testament verse where God the Father declared he was the I am. When he spoke to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3. And before I continue, there's this guy named Stephen Furtick that gave a really cool sermon that I'd like to share a little bit with you. It's not the entire thing, it's just part of it. But um, here it is, starting in verse 13 of chapter 3. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites. And say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And then they ask me, well, what do we call him? What's his name? Well, then God, what do I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Well, that's a heck of an answer, and I wish I had a deeper voice for this part, but I don't. And this is what you were to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, If you want to know who I am and what kind of God I am, then say this to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and I'm thinking he's going to say the God of Israel because that's that's Jacob's good side. If you were God and you wanted to make yourself known, wouldn't you want to call yourself the God of Israel? Wouldn't you want to be the God of that guy that was changed in the wrestling match? Wouldn't you want to be the God of their good side? But what he says to Moses and what he says to you today is that if you want to know who I am, what kind of God I am, you must understand that I'm the God of Jacob too. I'm not only the God of your success, I'm the God of your struggles. I am not only the God of your victories, I'm the God of your defeats. There is nothing stopping him. You see, what Jesus was saying all throughout John chapter 8 to the Pharisees was, 
before Abraham, I am. Before the words of creation were ever spoken, before your DNA was ever woven, I am. Before your minds were so creatively designed, before space and time were so perfectly entwined, I am. Before the water's first heavenly descent and before gravity told us where up went, I am. Before the wind was given direction and before the seas showed their mighty aggression, before you knew my love was as big as the ocean, before our relationship was hit by sin's erosion, I am. Before you made a God out of that thing in your pocket, before you got stingy with the money in your wallet, I am. Before Rafa House had to exist, before a father went to jail for using his fist. Before you found yourself living in discontent. Before you ever thought of giving Satan consent. Before you thought you could fight sin on your own. Before that voice told you you'd be all alone. Before you fell into that cave called depression trying to claw your way out, yet feeling nothing but suppression. Before you got comfortable in the dark. Before you thought watching porn could set a new spark. Before all sin would ever do is make your heart burn. Before you thought you hit the point of no return. I am. Who are you, Jesus? Could you possibly... Say, how could you possibly say things like that? You're just a man. Could you really be who you say you are? And going back to the story, my story, I was telling you earlier, little me was not in a good place. You see, those, those corrupting thoughts took root in my mind and created a new me, and one that I'm still being affected by today. Depression took over my life because I was never good enough. And because of a few other reasons, I attempted to take my life. Not once, but twice. But there is good news, brothers and sisters. Little Nathan did find his freedom. And I know I can't fully explain this to you, but that second time, that second time that I was trying to take my life, I heard this voice. And again, I can't explain it to you, but it was God's voice. And the crazy part is it was, it was coming from my mouth. He used my tongue. And he said, Nathan, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, I know it seems like there is no hope left for you. That there's nothing left in this world for you. But I promise you that's not the case. And I just sat there. Because that went against everything that I'd believed for the last two years of my life. And then he said, Nathan, I love you and I have plans for you. And in that moment, I dropped everything. I started bawling. I felt God's love wash over me for the first time and his Holy Spirit run through me for the first time. And I gave my life to him in that moment. I had been feeling this call for a long time, guys. And I had been ignoring it. Jesus is my freedom. Who is he to you? Here's the truth. Before sin stepped in to take you away and before death thought it had the final say, I am, I am Jesus, I am the creator, I am Elohim, I am your savior. I am the good shepherd that calls you by name, and I am the voice that called you out of the grave. I am the vine. I am the true vine, and you are my branches. I am the well that never will run dry, so come and drink, for there is so little time. I am the light of the world. Let my word clear up what the world has blurred. I am the way, the only way. 
I am the truth, the only truth, and I am the life. Here's the truth. Christ's divinity frees us from captivity. Our freedom is in obedience. Our freedom is in humility. And our freedom is in the fact that Jesus is God. We are no longer bound by the weight of sin and shame because Christ is the almighty, all-powerful God. So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed.